Hi everyone, welcome back to my channel. Today, before we get into discussing what books we're going to be talking about, I did just kind of want to do a reminder, um, there's something on the camera there, <laughs> uh, that from now on the book videos are going to be one video every two weeks. So this video is going to occur on, let's see, I think uh, it will be posted on the 16th of August instead of the 9th. And if you're kind of curious as to why specifically that is going on, um, I posted a video on July 8th. I'm looking at the calendar to make sure I don't mess up the date. I posted a video on July 8th going into more detail about why I'm doing it this way now. Um, so just kind of wanted to remind you all that this is the first book video where we're kind of taking two weeks, like a week in between the book videos. So wanted to throw that out there and I already have my eye primer on. Um, and before we get started, I will introduce the books that we're going to be reviewing over the next couple of weeks because this is a series. So we are going to be doing the series by Sarah J. Mass, <laughs> um, A Court of Thorns and Roses and all of the other books. So this it will only be four videos instead of five because I'm going to combine A Court of Wings and Ruin and A Court of Frost and Starlight into um, these two, the um, third and fourth book, into one video together just because I felt like I didn't have enough to write about this Frost and Starlight one on its own so I just incorporated it into the other video. So today we'll talk about a Court of Thorns and Roses, which is the first book. Um, when I wrote up all of, and I'll get started while I say this, today we're going to be, because this book is mainly focused on like the spring court and things like that, we're going to be doing like a pink and green look to kind of represent the spring court. So anyways, <laughs> just so you're aware. So I read all these books and then I finally decided to make this YouTube channel so when I was writing up the commentary for these books, I do just kind of want to say like I had read all of them already, but I kind of tried to write the commentary as if I haven't read the rest of them yet. So like my point of view on things, for example, kind of be like if I try to remember what I was feeling before I read the next books, you know, especially in terms of, you know, like what I think of Tamlin, for example. Um, you know, so I'm going to be kind of stating things in a way that a lot of people probably won't agree with, but it's because I'm acting as if I only read this book so far. So that is kind of the perspective I'm trying to take. So that way it's not so biased because when I first read it, of course, I didn't have the feelings towards Tamlin that I do now after reading the next books. So. That's a kind of perspective that we're taking here. Um, and I do want to note, I probably will say people's names wrong or places wrong. Um, you know, it's made up places, made up names, weird names. So I'm probably going to pronounce something wrong. And please just bear with me <laughs> because I'm just doing it how I assumed would it would be pronounced or things like that because I mean she did for Feyre and Rhysan um, kind of like throw in parentheses how to pronounce their names which I've seen from like bookstagram like the Instagrams that are focused on books I've seen a lot of people say like they will never pronounce Rhysan as Rhysan they always do it as Rhysan and I think it's funny just because the only reason why I pronounce it right is because she did tell you how to do it in the book. <laughs> I think a lot of people just kind of skipped over that sentence. <laughs> and that's why they like always pronounce it incorrectly and they refuse to change it, which is totally fine and it's funny. So just throwing that out there. Um, this was my first time reading like a romance fantasy style like fairy type book. I had never read anything like this before. The only other books I have read that kind of resemble that fantasy style writing and genre are the Kingdom of the Wicked, Kingdom of the Cursed books by, um, oh, 
what's her name? Carrie Maniscalio, or I don't know how you say her last name. I also can barely read where her name's written on the books from over here. <laughs> I don't have my glasses on. So, um, anyway, so this is like my first introduction into the fairy romance fantasy genre. Um, so that was interesting for me because I'd never read anything like this before. And I wasn't totally sure if I would like it, but I wanted to try it. And I actually really ended up enjoying it quite a bit. Um, I really had fun while I was reading it. And the one thing I appreciated was how um, Sarah, I'll just call the author Sarah. I'm not going to say her whole name the whole time. Um, I really appreciated how she did the world building in this book. Because, you know, sometimes I just like that she kind of gradually did it over the entire book. She didn't take like the first 10 chapters just to do world building and explain everything. No, she kind of incorporated it into the story, made it <clears throat> more natural for how you were learning about the world that you're reading about and just made it so much easier to like understand and figure out um and i appreciated that because it's always confusing to me when like you read a more fantasy genre or just anything where there has to be some world building and they like take so much time to build it that there's so much detail that you forget things you're confused you feel kind of overwhelmed and then it's hard to picture the world but I felt like the way she did it was really nice and kind of like a gradual build so that way it just felt easier to understand easier to grasp you were kind of able to picture everything and picture the world that you were reading about and I did really appreciate that especially as someone that hasn't read a ton of fantasy genres before um and especially nothing like this where there's like the fairies and things like that so I I appreciated like how she went about doing the world building and made it so it was easier to grasp and understand um I also kind of like that in the beginning she kind of just focused on um, introducing Feyre and her family and their story and you know like of course things were also revealed about them gradually like what exactly kind of happened what happened to their mom like why they're living in this cabin and things like that um, but I just kind of like that in the beginning she took the time to explain the Archeron I think that's how you say their last name um, took the time to explain their story and also kind of introducing the girls personalities a little bit like Elaine is gentle and quiet and just sweet and Nessa is like the complete opposite of Elaine and and then there's you know um Feyre who's like she's kind of her own she doesn't she has a little bit of qualities of kind of both of the sisters, but at the same time, she's totally different and she's independent and takes care of the family. Like she basically plays the father and mother role, even though she's the youngest. So I kind of, I liked how she introduced the family. It kind of made you sympathetic and feel like really sad for Feyre because of everything she's dealing with. And it kind of helps you to grasp like later on in the book when she's kind of having some traumatic experiences kind of helps you grasp why she's experiencing things the way that she is um so I liked the way that they introduced them and kind of introduced the sisters and you know kind of kept it basic for the other sisters because you know she Sarah knew that she would use later books to dedicate towards the sisters and explain them a little bit more and why they act the way that they do especially Nesta 
it's not like we've had that with Elaine yet, but that's me jumping forward. So we're going to <laughs> stop doing that. <laughs> um, yeah, so just kind of explaining the family a little bit and that kind of helps to lay out like when certain things happen, why the family reacts the way that they do, why they take the actions that they take. Um, you know, it kind of just helped to make more sense because of how she laid it out and explained the characters to begin with. And I did like that a lot. Um, so, let's see, what was next I wanted to talk about? I also kind of liked how she planned out how to kind of like get Feyre into the fairy lands, like how she planned, how Sarah planned like, okay, I'm gonna make it so someone has to, in order to break this curse, a human has to be like brave enough to kill a fairy or whatever and whoever does that, that person's gonna be, you know, kind of like kidnapped or whatever and taken into the fairy lands and then if they fall in love with Tamlin, like it'll help break the curse, blah, blah, blah. And I just kind of thought that was an interesting way to kind of cause that situation to happen. Like rather than just letting the fairies kind of be like, we're just gonna kidnap someone and force them to live with Tamlin and see if he can get them to fall in love with them, like the typical Beauty and the Beast story you have going on there. She's just like, no, we're gonna, we're gonna add a little bit more to it and make it so, you know, an act had to be done for this to happen. You're not just gonna like randomly kidnap someone. So I kind of like how she had planned that out obviously before she like wrote the book and kind of, it just, I felt like it made it more, um, I don't know. It just felt like she thought it through more than sometimes when you read a book and you're just like, I feel like they're just having that happen just to have it happen versus like thinking about it in a more detailed way. So I did like that. And Tamlin, so Tamlin in this story, taking bias out of it and acting like I haven't read the other books yet, <laughs> is more like a fairy tale character. So he's like the typical Beauty and the Beast situation. You know, he's a beast, but at the same time, like, he, you know, seems to care about Feyre and is actually trying to be nice and help her out and get over like his rude behaviors and things like that. Just very similar to like the Beauty and the Beast story portrayed by Disney even. Um, so I like, so that's kind of, you know, them, she was treating him more like a fairy tale character, kind of making his entrance seem more fairy tale like the beast and the, you know, the poor girl that has to deal with him and teach him manners and teach him lessons and things like that. You know, they were helping each other. Um, and the way that he's portrayed in the first book, like, yeah, he's got some rough patches and things, but you, you like him in the first book. Like, you like him, you think he's, you know, nice and he treats Feyre pretty good and you know he's trying to help her and he you know I don't know I felt like just thinking about how I felt when I first read the book and hadn't read the rest of them yet I do feel like she kind of tried to you know she wanted you to like him she wanted you to kind of like Feyre and Tamlin together and I think she did a good job at that like I haven't seen a lot of people's opinions on that, like if I'm scrolling through Instagram and scroll through like people who 
always post about this series and stuff. But I did see one the other day that was kind of just like, oh, like you liked Tamlin at first and blah, blah, blah. And kind of was my same feelings on it. Like you do like him at first. And then, then she makes everything else happen that, you know, you kind of no longer like Tamlin. But I'm trying to review this as if I haven't read that yet. <laughs> So at first, I just felt like he was good for Feyre, you know, he got her out of the cabin and where she had to take care of people and they were starving to death. And I feel like she was starving more than her sisters because she was trying to make sure everyone else was taken care of. So she was worse off than everyone else. Um, so you know, he's helping take care of her, he's trying to help her to be able to relax and not be in like a fight or flight situation all of the time because she is you know like she's from the age of how old was she like 11 when they had to go to the cabin you know she's been in like a constant fight or flight stage so you know he's kind of getting her out of that trying to help her to relax trying to help her see like, you know, a different side of the world and that she doesn't have to constantly be like on edge and things like that. Um, so from the perspective of only having read the first book so far, I like Tamlin. Uh, I think he needs some work as well, but who doesn't, you know? <laughs> So that's kind of my perspective on Tamlin from just the first book only um, and how things are going so far. I also really liked Lucy, Lucian's character. Um, I'm not totally sure if that's how you pronounce his name, but I really liked his character. I felt like he was something, he was someone that Feyre kind of needed, someone to be able to rely on and help that kind of was outside of her situation like yeah he lived at the spring court but like he kind of understood that Tamlin's behaviors were not always the best and that he's you know pretty scary when he does like the beast form and kind of letting the beast take over his temper and things like that you know it was someone that she could kind of like vent to and have a friend relationship with because he kind of understood things as well and he saw things from a similar perspective as her so it was kind of like he was a needed friend and character to help her to adjust to being taken into the fairylands and having to now like deal with this beast person and kind of not knowing him and his like behavior and how he's going to react to things and when he's going to kind of lose it and stuff like that. Uh, he also, you know, he provided some humor in the book and kind of helped provide just an outlet and like relief from some of the other stuff happening in the story I think is kind of what I'm trying to say um and it also just shows how important Lucian is because in this first book like Lucian is really important because he is able to help like keep control of Tamlin he's able to help him to stay in control, to kind of like chill and not let the beast take over. Like Lucian works really hard to like help him to manage that so he doesn't one, scare the crap out of people <laughs> and two, so he doesn't end up destroying stuff all the time because instead of thinking, he just immediately goes into a rage. Um, and I just feel like it just shows how important Lucian is to the story. And I just, I do really like how she introduced his character 
kind of explained a little bit about him but left his backstory more of a mystery um which you know slowly breaks down throughout the rest of the books um so i really like lucian and i i just i like his character even like now <laughs> um i do have a soft spot for him so i like how they introduced his character and kind of showed his importance and things like that um one thing that i thought was interesting was how they kind of introduced resand to Feyre. i got some glitter on my face from that one shade is really glittery oh well it's okay um, I kind of just liked how they introduced Rhysand to Feyre and, um, you know, trying not to think of the other books and what I know about him. I was really scared for Feyre at that point in the book. You know, she was about to be attacked by these other fairies. Rhysand comes and saves her, but he also kind of comes off as, like, creepy and scary and, like, he could possibly hurt her as well. Um, and so like, I remember when I was reading, I was kind of on high alert. I was like, like, what is going to happen here? Um, like this is a freaky situation and you're just kind of like yelling at Feyre in your mind. Like you shouldn't have left the stupid house. Like you should have listened because now you're in this situation and you know, you didn't really know what was going to happen. So I know we saved her and you know. If I let my bias from the rest of the books come in, you kind of understand Rhysand's personality more and get that he would have never hurt her or whatever and he was just kind of portraying his like, hmm, I don't even know the term I wanna use, but like his cocky, you know, personality and stuff like that that he puts on for a show sometimes and that's also just part of who he is, like, I honestly, <laughs> but, you know, if I don't take into consideration that and remember what I actually felt like when I was first reading, like, I was freaked out, I was like, what's gonna happen to her? I mean, this is creepy, this guy is kind of, like, scary, um, and that's kind of how I felt when they first introduced him, like, he came off as scary to me, and kind of just weird like i didn't know how he was going to play into the rest of the story i could tell that he was going to be a bigger character and he kind of freaked me out like that's how i felt when she first introduced him was he freaked me out more than anything um <laughs> so you know if i'm trying to not make it biased by taking future knowledge into the consideration because I read the rest of the books now. He scared me when he was first introduced. And that's all there is to it, really. Um, and then I do really like that, you know, they, Sarah kind of introduced that favorite is pretty brave and she's strong and she's capable um even you know with everything that's happened to her in her past and stuff so the fact that she was able to just like go back and like get back into the fairylands and save Tamlin and all of them I kind of just like that because you know she was being portrayed as this really like strong independent character and they she let it continue you know she let her this human like get back into the lands and um i just realized i never turned this on hopefully the lighting hasn't been bad <laughs> um you know she got back into the fairy lands she got all the way under the mountain and she did what she had to do to survive and, you know, did her best to try to win. I also think it's a testament to Nessa during this part in the book because 
it's revealed that when Feyre goes back home, like it's revealed that Nesta remembers what happened. She remembers that Feyre was taken by Tamlin. She remembers the scary stuff. She remembers that they lived in a shack and not this mansion. She remembers that they had lost all their money and actually didn't have money. You know, I just think that's like a little foreshadowing to how powerful Nesta is and how strong she is and to not like underestimate her because she is a force to be reckoned with, you know. So I, I like that too because it that part in the book just kind of shows how strong these two sisters are that had two completely different like circumstances happen once the family lost money like they both took on different roles and had different scenarios happen to them once they lost money but they both are still like really strong and stubborn and it kind of just helps to show how the sisters relate to each other um even though they are rather different in their personalities like they are similar in certain ways so i did like that as well um the whole part of the story when she's under the mountain was like really stressful I don't know about you guys but when I was reading I was like this is a lot like there's a lot happening there's a lot that could happen like this is a scary situation <laughs> and it was like really stressful um so I did like feel stressed out reading that whole section of the book because she did kind of play it off in a way to where I didn't know it was going to happen. I honestly didn't know if Favor would survive or if she would be successful or, you know, how things were going. Um, and looking back and trying to remember how I felt while reading, I always thought it was interesting that like Resan kept risking his life to like go and help Feyre after certain um not missions but some of the things that she had to do to win and how he would like be the one to go back and you know help her so she didn't die from a wound or something like that and I always was kind of like how come Tamlin isn't like risking his life and sneaking down there and helping her so she doesn't die like everyone saw she was badly injured and you know knew like Rhysan that she's probably gonna die from that injury but yet Tamlin's didn't go down there Lucian went once didn't he he went down there one time but then he wasn't able to go back because they had almost caught him the first time or something like that or but at least Lucian went down there one time like Tamlin didn't go down there at all and I remember when I was reading I was like that's odd that this Rhysand guy <laughs> would go down there like what's his motive here because he didn't seem like he wanted Amarantha or whatever her name is to lose that's how I feel like she kind of, Sarah kind of portrayed him at first. So she didn't really know what side this guy was on. Um, so that was interesting to me. Um, and the fact that he like helped her during the trial when she had to like read to be able to win. You know, because they realized like, oh, she cannot read. Like she doesn't know how to read she's not going to get this and her and Lucian are both going to die <laughs> poor Lucian I just feel like he's like dragged into everything to be honest I feel like he just gets the short end of the stick all the time whatever so that was curious to me when I was reading if I look back like why why is Rhysand going down to help her all the time and aiding her, making sure she doesn't die, but yet Tamlin doesn't do anything.
So that was interesting to me why they did it that way. Um, or why that would be occurring. And just kind of curious as to why Resan seems to be protecting her, helping her out, making sure she lives. Kind of seems to have like a bond with her and likes her in a way. But he doesn't fully portray that he likes her. It's just kind of a feeling you get. And it's kind of just like when I was reading the book, this book first, I was like, hmm, this is weird. But obviously Sarah was hinting at the future and that things would be revealed you know that would make it known as to why he would be doing things like that <laughs> um but anyways not talking about that um i also thought it was interesting so you know Feyre completes all of the tasks amaranth is still like kills or whatever and then I just thought it was interesting after everything that all of the High Lords were like, yeah, we'll save her. It just seemed surprising because, you know, they're High Lords, they're leaders, they have big egos and stuff like that. They're not going to want to share a piece of their power to save her, but they do. And that, that was really surprising to me that they would do that. Um... And it was just really interesting. Also, like, I remember when I was reading that I was kind of just surprised that Resan had such a big reaction when Feyre is killed. Like, he, you know, like, it debilitates him. He, like, reacts so majorly. And it was kind of surprising. Like, why is he reacting like that? Like, Tamlin, obviously... He also had a big reaction. I mean, he went and killed Amarantha, didn't he? He's the one that killed her. Um, but still, like, Resand also had a really big reaction. And it was kind of surprising and made you curious as to why he would react that way. Um, again, some more foreshadowing and things like that there. Um... And, you know, after that, then Feyre starts to feel this bond and pull towards Rhysand and she doesn't fully understand it. But, I guess this kind of goes into the next book or whatever, but, you know, it kind of acknowledges in the next, in the next story that, like, she had felt that pull and bond before she realized what it was. Because she acknowledges that when she died, she didn't actually feel like she died because she was still seeing things. Like, she saw, like, Tamlin's reaction and everything. And it was because she was seeing it through Rhysand. And, you know, that was interesting. And we get that explanation as to why later. But that was also curious, like, why she didn't just die right away. She kind of was in a limbo phase. Um, so I thought that was interesting too. And just, I felt like, I really just like the way Sarah tells the story. I feel like, you know, you get a good amount of detail, but there's also still mystery and you kind of get to learn about these characters, but at the same time, she doesn't give everything away you know, it's a good way to keep readers engaged, to keep them wanting to come back for more, to, you know, have another book to be able to read. All of those types of things, you know, it keeps you in business, <laughs> basically. But, you know, it's fun for the readers when it's written in a way that you want to keep reading, you want another book, you want another story, you want to be able to figure out why characters are acting a certain way or why they seem to have some type of connection and things like that. 
so I liked that. Um, and then the end, you know, the end of the book just kind of hints at Feyre is going to be struggling, um, you know, and she's going to be having some issues with PTSD, you know, but it's not called that obviously in the book, but you know, like struggling with all of the trauma from the things she had to do to try to free everyone and make sure no one died, to make sure she didn't die. You know, it, it hints that the next book, there's going to be some, you know, um, storylines showing that she is not doing well necessarily and that she's going to need some help um and the book kind of ends in a way to where it seems like Tamlin's going to be able to help her with that and seems like he's going to be you know there for her but then obviously we know that that's not the case um but we're not going to delve into that because that's the next book <laughs> uh so I just and it also kind of hints at she feels a pull and connection with Resand, and that's going to play a part in the next book as well. Like, what the deal is with that and why that seems to be existing. Um, so that's kind of interesting as well. A little bit of mascara I got on my eye here. So looking funny. So we'll fix that. So that's the whole book. Overall, just based off the first book, I really liked everything. Um, I just thought Sarah did a really good job again with the world building, the explaining, not not going too in depth so quickly, just to make sure you don't get overwhelmed or that you know, you feel like there's too much going on and you can't comprehend everything. You know, she did it at a good pace and in a good way to where it's like you get to see this world, you can picture it, you can imagine it, but not so quickly to where you feel like you can't comprehend what she's saying or um, you know, what she's trying to portray. She does it at like a good speed, a good pace, and a good amount of detail too. Like it's not too quick or too much all at once and things like that. I also just felt like, you know, she did a good job at making you like Feyre, helping you to see like she's struggling but she's strong and things like that. But then also kind of I mean, you like Tamlin after the first book, I think. Like, I liked Tamlin. I thought, you know, you know, I was happy at the end. Like, oh, they get to be together and blah, blah, blah. <laughs> but, you know, that's how it was at the end of the first one anyways. Um, so, yeah, I mean, that was... This is the first series I've read on like the fairy stuff. I know there's a ton more. I would love recommendations from you guys about like stories with not necessarily similar things or a similar theme or anything like that, but anything that you feel like, you know, if you like reading this, you'll probably like reading that. I would love recommendations because I did have a lot of fun reading this and it honestly caught me by surprise because I've never been one to read anything like this. I just wanted to try it because I saw it being raved about so much on Instagram and I was like, I need to, like, I need to look into this. I want to see what this is about and I'm glad I did. I think it's a lot of fun. I think, I mean, all of the creators I've seen that post about this just seem like a lot of fun and they really like everything and they really enjoy the series and they break it down nice and they have like good insights and things like that so you know 
I really enjoyed it. I would love to know your guys' opinions on the book and how you felt and if you liked things or if you didn't like certain pieces and you know what you liked what you didn't like what you you know if there's anything that you feel differently on from what I said like I would just love to hear your guys's thoughts and know like how you felt about the story or the characters um or if you like didn't like it like you read it and you were like this is not for me and you didn't like it you know I would just love to hear your opinions and thoughts and things like that so please leave them down below I'm just finishing this up just kind of touching up right here so I kind of did like a I wanted to do for these books kind of like some themed looks based off of the different courts that seem to be kind of like the main focus during that book or you know picking like a a different court that I feel like we do get information about so I have a look that I want to do for the night court and the autumn court and things like that so that's kind of my plan so hopefully we can get that to work but I will zoom in and show you guys this look in just a second um, I hope you guys you know continue to tune in for the videos I hope you'll subscribe um, like the videos if you're liking the content subscribe to view more future content just all of it you know um, and I'm looking forward to doing the next book in this series because it's a lot of fun that book I feel like that book is some of one of the favorite ones um, that people have so I'm looking forward to doing it um, but this is the look today so I'll zoom you in real quick um, one second okay let's see so I kind of just did like a springy pink look and then I did this green shimmer that I have it's kind of it has a little bit of blue to it I feel like it's kind of like a tealy green and I did a like a bright pink shimmer in the center of it just to lighten it up a little bit did a pink like inner corner it's white but it has a pink like shift to it and things and then I just did a similar matte shade that I have um, to this green shimmer I did that on the lower lash line so that's the look today. Hopefully you can see it pretty good in the camera. I don't totally know <laughs> how you can see it, but um, I will link all of the shades down below. I just use a mixture of my Lethal Cosmetics shades, but the look mainly came from this palette. I used these two pinks, um, this pink shimmer, this is the green that's on the lower lash, and then the shimmer green that I used Um, is this one right here which I used in my Harry Potter commentary video as well if you guys haven't seen that I would love to go watch that one too so <laughs> um, please subscribe if you like the content to, to be able to tune in for our next book um, video which will be on A Court of Mist and Fury that's what that one's called isn't it yes it is so that's the look today for A Court of Thorns and Roses by Sarah J. Mass. The next one will be on the next book in this series and I hope you guys stay tuned to continue to watch. Thanks. Bye.